everybody. In most cases, beer is what first brings a guest in. If you're not making quality beer, then odds are you're in trouble. In today's changing landscape, you not only have to put out delicious beer, but also give guests other reasons to return. How can you take that one time or occasional guest and turn them into a, a regular? So important. Today, I'm joined by several guests to talk about the importance of experience and how to build loyalty. And now, Let's meet our guests in West because you are to the right of me. You have the honor of going first. Thanks for joining us again. Of course. Thank you for having me, Andrew. And uh, it's great to be back. Love all the programming CBP puts on and all the amazing people I've met through the program. Uh, quick intro on me, Wes Clark. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Harvest Host. Uh, we are not a brewery. We are a very unique RV membership program. And what we do is we connect RV travelers with amazing small businesses all across North America and uh, RVers are able to stay at these locations overnight uh, with no camping fees. All we do is they ask, we, we ask them to patronize the local business and we've got over 500 breweries on the network, uh, 2000 farms, over 800 wineries, just an amazing, amazing network of, of unique local businesses. I'm particularly passionate about the brewery space uh, and we found it to be such an uh, amazing win-win program for both breweries as well as travelers. And, and we can talk about that more as we go. And I'm still waiting for the CBP Harvest Host co-branded RV to show up in my front yard, ready for me to tour the country. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. That's the next webinar. <laughs> Thanks, Wes. Tammy, nice to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Tell us a little bit more about your brewery and what you do. All right. Well, um, I'm from Saluria Brewing, and we are a small, I would call us a little nano brewer um, here in the heart of Alabaster, Alabama. We've been in business for five years and basically been Harvest Host um, host for uh, four, going on four years. So excited to learn more about your brewery. Thanks for joining us today, Tammy. Absolutely. And Beth, excited to have you as well. You are not in Alabama. Where in the world are you? I am not in Alabama. I am on <laughs> Cape Cod. Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Beth Marcus. My husband and I own and operate Cape Cod Beer. Um, we are a 20 year old and we will be 20 on April 15th. So we are a 20 year old uh, microbrewery um, that has a beer garden and has been a harvest host for about, I guess, four years probably. Um, but we've been in operation for 20 years and have evolved from before there were tap rooms to now there are tap rooms. Tap rooms are all the rage and beer gardens and things like that. And uh, and so we uh, we are a self-distributing microbrewery. So we not only have a taproom space, but we also self-distribute. The state of Massachusetts allows us to distribute. And so we have about, I don't know, I guess 600 customers and we deliver beer within about 50 miles of the brewery. Um, we brew on a 30 barrel system and we right now brew about 6,000 barrels a year. So you stay pretty busy. That's awesome. Congrats on 20 years. Yeah, thank you. So Beth, I'm really curious, you know, in the past 20 years, you know, I imagine when you first opened, we weren't using the word experience too much with regard to breweries. When would you say that started to become something you focused on? Uh, it's, it's sort of like trying to remember when in your child's life they started doing something. Somewhere between, no. <laughs> um, the challenge is that there was no such thing as a tap room. And when we started, there were only a thousand breweries in the United States. So I don't know, latest count is somewhere, was somewhere around 10,000. So somewhere in the middle of all that, um, licenses started to be issues for people to have tap rooms and tap rooms turned into beer gardens. I think COVID really cemented the idea of people loving to be outside and drinking outside and experiencing beer outside. And so all of that has just continued to grow. Um, but I would say, I think maybe 2013, 2014, uh, I think is when we got our first uh, license to pour beer officially to the public. No, does awesome. that answer your question? <laughs> it does. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. Tammy, how about you? You know, why is experience important to you? Well, I think with us, you know, being a small brewery, we've been in business for five years now. Um, we were the first one in Shelby County that um, here in Alabama. And so it was just us trying to figure out, um, what works, <laughs> honestly, you know, um, what the customers wanted, what we needed, you know, in return to build a relationship. We're more, um, because we are a small brewery, we're very much um, 
focused on making relationships with our customers. So that has enabled us to, um, it's been great with the harvest hosts. It's been great with just our regular customers to have an area, like Beth was saying, the beer garden. We, we had a small beer garden when we first opened. We expanded that during um, COVID. And so that's kind of been a big draw to our customers is having the open air area for them to sit with their families. Tammy, you opened five years ago pre-pandemic and you're still here now. So that, that, that's awesome. But, you know, how did your mindset change from 2018 until now? You know, I know, Beth, you know, 20 years in the industry running a brewery, a lot has changed. But you've been in it five. But even in the past five years, a lot has changed. You know, how has your mindset for running the brewery evolved over those few years? Well, I think for us, um, Alabama's still a little bit behind in the self-distributing category. So we, we're not allowed to do that. Um, I think for our mindset going in was um, we, we really were focusing on being a tap room. Um, we were just kind of wanting to be the local pub. And um, and the, we knew we were going to kind of have to do the 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 crawl walk, you know, before we could get hit the ground running. So it was like focused on tap room and then focused on doing um, distribu distribution. And then, of course, then at some point we'd love to be like in the manufacturing side of canning, bottling, send out into the public. Well, I hope to visit someday. Awesome. We'd love to have you. N now, Wes, you know, from your point of view, I mean, I think this aligns really well with Harvest Host. Why is experience so important? Why, you know, should breweries be focusing on it as a differentiator? Yeah, I mean, we have the the pleasure of working with over 500 breweries. And, you know, if you think about a network of 5,000 small businesses, uh, everyone's just craving experiences. We see it all the time in, in research in the camping space, but I think it applies to just kind of the broader, I think they call it the experiential economy now. But people are shifting their spending from goods to experiences and obviously that's benefiting the, the brewery industry and the tap rooms and uh i see it all the time with our members talking about like i had so much fun doing this you know being outside drinking a beer sitting around a campfire talking to the owners talking to the brewers um playing trivia doing movie night like whatever it is i like that's just it's a unique and fun way to travel especially for rv travelers and when locations and, and breweries deliver that experience I know our members are they're avid about sharing that, not only in the reviews on the site. Uh, I think Beth has close to 400. Tammy's got over 800. Like, that's a lot of people posting really good, nice things to say about you guys. Uh, but then they also take that word out just in the campgrounds they visit. So if they're just down the road in Alabama staying, they're saying, hey, go check out this brewery. It's great. Um, you know, all sorts of campgrounds up in, in Cape Cod during the summer pushing the word there. And then lastly, they're, they're taken to the social media. And so the word's getting out, like that one experience has now affected people in person and the digital space, et cetera, and, and helps grow uh, the audience. Like that one great experience can have such amazing ripple effects. And, you know, I love seeing that. I love going on our Facebook group and seeing everyone be like, I had the best time at this brewery or that brewery. And, you know, if you go in, make sure you chat with Beth, they have an amazing story, like things like that. It's, it, it's fun to watch. And Wes, obviously just, you know, staying at a brewery, parking your RV camper and staying at the brewery, that's an experience in itself. But do you yeah. find that your travelers are also looking for unique events and other types of experiences when they're doing their planning? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the road trip is the great American experience generally, right? Like uh, you're out there, there's all types of campers and RVers. Some are extreme planners a year out. Uh, and then you have the last minute crew, which, which is always a fun group too. And it's just whatever floats your boat. You know, some folks want to have every single stop planned and they're doing it around points of interest and great places to eat, great places to drink. And then some folks are just, let's go down that road for two hours and see what happens. And, um, you know, they're, they're both getting incredible experiences out of that. Harvest Toast is a key part of a lot of their best experiences. I think obviously I'm biased, but I hear all the time from our members about being able to string together such a an array of experiences on a single road trip during a single year has become really powerful. And it's just the collection of experiences too, you know, the Cape Cod and um, Tammy's location are very different, but they're also both amazing experiences that add to the overall journey. 
Now, Tammy, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your space. Before I ask you a question, though, I saw on your social media that you had a food truck last night that I have to ask you about. Wasabi wands, sushi burritos. Is that <laughs> real? That is, Tell me about it. that is absolutely real. Um, and that is one of our fan favorites. I mean, our customers love wasabi wands. It's basically sushi rolled up into the like a size of a burrito. <laughs> and so um, awesome. they have about 20 different, um, I guess, sushi style burritos to choose from. And um, yeah, it's fresh and customers love it. So there was a brewery I went to here in Virginia about a month ago, and I had sushi for the first time at a brewery, and I didn't realize how much that made the experience. You know, having that fantastic food, being in a new tap room, learning the whole story, pairing it with the beer, like I felt so connected that day. And you know, <laughs> who thought sushi would have played that role in my experience? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Tammy, you know, looking at all the cool things you're doing at Celeria, what are some of the events you're most proud of that you host that you believe are pretty memorable for your guests? Oh, wow. We, we have, we have several, um, our, I guess our, our latest big, huge event was our Taylor Swift karaoke. Um, that was absolutely crazy. Um, and we had, you know, harvest guests that stayed with us that really didn't know that that was going to be happening that night that came in and were just like, wow, <laughs> you know, and I think for us, we I have great, great media folks that work for us and they just, they stay up on everything that's hot going on right now. And that was just a, a sitting at a staff meeting and it's like, Hey, what do you think about Taylor Swift? And I'm like, I don't know. Do you think that many people want to come to hear her, you know, do karaoke with her songs? And they were like, absolutely. So I was a little hesitant, but they, they proved me wrong. So um, that was, awesome. yeah, that was crazy. It was great though. Why was it so much of a success? Obviously you had a lot of people there, but did you notice a lot of people. Longer spending more? What'd you see? We did. Um, so we are family friendly. So, but we did set it at 13 and above because we, you know, it's a little bit harder to manage when you have smaller children running around when you have a big event like that. So, um, so we had a lot of teens and, and up and we did specialty. We had our brewer made a, a great lavender beer and just was phenomenal. So a lot of people came in to try that. We had mocktails for the, um, for the underage that kind of went along with some of Taylor Swift's names of her songs and things. So, and I think just, you know, with something new, something different. So, and karaoke tends to be a, a really, really fun, fun night. So. What about awesome. the feel of the brewery? Did you do any unique decorations to give it that Taylor Swift vibe? <laughs> so if you've, if you've looked at any of our social media, you know, that's our, that's our niche. We love to decorate. So uh, we did, we had, um, we had several things. We had some bad blood stuff kind of hanging out. Um, we had um, a local, a uh, hobby shop donated um, the little beads to make the friendship bracelet. So we had a little friendship bracelet booth to do those and had the little, you know, Taylor Swift stickers and stuff around and people could take those. So just things, you know, the small little things like that, that everybody enjoyed kind of sharing the different um, stickers with each other and the bracelets, swapping bracelets, friendship bracelets with each other. So, and we had a group of teachers that absolutely killed it that night. They, <laughs> they were, they were the hit of the party for sure. So for anyone interested in hosting Taylor Swift karaoke at your brewery, Tammy can give you lots of great advice. There. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's awesome. Beth, what about you? You know, at Cape Cod Beer, what are some of the events or experiences you have that get you really excited? Uh, I mean, we do a bunch of annual events. So every year we have a big oyster event in the fall. We have an Oktoberfest. We, we do multiple we're kind of big Grateful Dead fans, so we do multiple Grateful Dead themed events. Um, and it's it's hard to say which one's your favorite because they all bring in a different group of people, right? You're, Are you doing you don't any this... Grateful Dead karaoke yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that would go over, honestly. <laughs> the only karaoke we've done is as, as as part of staff parties, so I'm not sure if the person <laughs> you know managing the events is not a karaoke fan. But we uh, we do music bingo, and you know we do a lot of sort of regular events. And it, it's funny because we've been doing it for 20 years, so things have changed. Before COVID, we 
we had a lot of really small events. We had hula hoop classes and yoga classes. And, and then because COVID sort of stopped all of that, we've now gone and we do a lot more big events. We've really um, sort of doubled down on the live music thing. Um, we do a lot of dog uh, themed events. Um, we have a, a, a St. Patrick's Day event coming up for dogs. Um, you know, so we, we kind of, we kind of do a lot of different things. And what we realize is that, I mean, the demographic on Cape Cod year round uh, skews a little bit older. So sometimes we're just trying to find a new group of people that we haven't, you know, found a place with yet. Um, we've done a lot of teacher events. We've done some first uh, responder events. We do a lot of charity events. Um, and so it's just, it's really about sort of reading, you know, for lack of a better term, reading the room, figuring out what people are into these days. Um, recently, Music Bingo has been, you know, kind of gaining some steam for us, which, you know, during the week. Um, and uh, and the hard part is that everybody wants the things that we've done last year to happen, but they also want new things. So you're, you're, all, you're constantly like, okay, we have to do the old things, but we have to do some new things too. So, um, but it's really just about sort of creating this, uh, you know, I don't know, sometimes the term is a little bit overused, but this third space, right? The place, like you don't want to be at work and you don't want to be at home. So where's that place I want to be that makes me feel comfortable, that that my friends are at, that I know people that, you know, we're, we're not a super fancy place. We just try to kind of have a, a you know, a comfortable vibe. And, um, and so it's really just about, you know, sort of like the, the thought about Taylor Swift, like that's a cool hip in the news sort of thing. So that's a, you know, a great idea. Beth, when it comes to your live music, cause you do quite a bit of it, you know, I know a lot of breweries I talk with, you know, have some questions about, is it worth it to bring in the musicians, to bring in the bands? You know, how do you determine whether it, you know, is the right move for your business? I mean, are you doing it consistently on certain days of the week? Are you planning just big one-off concerts? And like, what metrics are you looking at to evaluate whether it was a good idea to bring that band or artist in? Yeah, well, you got right to the heart of it. I'm a big <laughs> fan of the magic eight ball. You shake it and <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's hard because sometimes the band does really well and sometimes the band doesn't do really well. And so ultimately uh, we do, we, we kind of separate our music. We have free live music uh, certain nights of the week where it's basically like a singer songwriter, you know, single, maybe two people with a guitar. Um, and then we do sort of bands, you know, and part of it is we try to really partner with the bands because in any of these events, at least the way I see it, you're trying to get your Venn diagram of customers and their Venn diagram of customers to overlap. And so as long as we're both doing a good job promoting the event, um, we can, you know, our goal is to cover the cost of the band, right? Um, and, you know, people that sell food, we don't sell food at our brewery, but people that sell food have a, an even better chance of covering the cost. But it's really, it's, it's a math, it's a math problem. Um, and so what we try really hard to do with the bands is we just try to get it out there as soon as we possibly can. You can't give people 15 days to, you know, sell $3,000 worth of tickets. You can't, you have to give them more time. Uh, Cause it takes a long time, especially for natural integration into like social media and stuff like that. Um, and so we just try to, you know, plan stuff far and ahead and, and get the bands to, you know, commit to the dates and, and then try to put enough for lack of a better term, hype around it so that people want to be there. So you're and doing we, some ticketed concerts. Oh yeah, we do yeah. a fair amount, fair number of them. Yep. So I, now I'm curious for both you and Beth. You know, when you do your, or you and Tammy, when you do your ticketed events, you know, how do you make people aware that there's a cost associated with coming today? That way, you don't have regulars show up, get frustrated. You know, any tips for spreading the word to avoid any frustrations? It's hard. Um, frequently, we try to make sure that it's you know, if we're gonna, we try. We frequently aren't closed specifically. You know, so if we're open and you just want to come and have your growler filled and it's there's a cover at the door because we have an all day multi band thing going on, we'll let you go in and just have your growler filled. Right. Because we don't want to upset those customers. Every once in a while, you'll have somebody who'll be upset because the five dollar cover that goes to charity. Oh, is I know. Too much for them. <laughs> you know, you're like, OK, sorry. <laughs> um, but just getting the word out that we're closed, you know, making sure that's part of our messages on social media and that it's on our calendar that we're closed for a, you know, a ticketed event. Um, 
that it's hard. It's a, it's kind of the same thing with you want to do private events, you want to take private events, but you don't want to be closed all the time either, because people get frustrated when they show up on a Thursday night and you're closed because you have somebody's re-election campaign in your tap room. Um, in the warm weather, we try to do both. Like you guys can have inside and the public can have outside or the public can have under the tent and the, you know, whatever. And so we just, we try to do both so that we don't have to specifically turn people away, but it's an issue. One of the things that we started doing um, is putting out two months in advance what our calendar looks like. And we have that posted in the brewery. We have it in the bathroom stalls. We have it on the door going out. Um, that way they know that what things are coming up. And if there is a cover charge, then we will go ahead and put it on that little flyer and um, that it's, you know, $5 cover for that particular band. And we also, you know, just on our social media, we, we go ahead and it's like, hey, live music, $5 cover to, you know, and so, and we start posting that stuff again, about three to four weeks out so that people know, hey, this band's coming up, be ready to pay $5 per person to come in to, to hear the music. And the same thing, we're just trying to cover the band. And majority of the time when we have music as well, that the money that we make from that night, a portion of that always goes into some type of um, fundraiser. And we do a lot with our veterans. We do a lot, same things, you know, with the um, our sheltered animals, um, a lot of nonprofit groups. We, we try to do local community um, nonprofits. And so, um, just with, you know, trying to keep that in mind and we try to advertise that this, these donations are going towards, and then that way the, you know, the public knows what those funds are going towards. Now, Tammy, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into that. So many breweries, you know, finding great community partners to work with and so many different angles there because you want to do good for your own community, but you also want to attract a new audience. I know Beth, you talked about that earlier, bringing bands in that bring in new people perhaps. So Tammy, when you're finding organizations to bring on as partners, potentially for some sort of fundraiser, what criteria are you looking for when you're finding the right fit? When we first started, it was us kind of searching out people. And I know um, there was one, a um, an organization that helped children that were fostering out of the foster care system. Um, and so we had to do reaching out to them. And it was, you know, little, they were a little bit iffy with us being a brewery and we kept trying to emphasize, you know, we're family friendly, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is not your, you know, it's not a bar. It is a family friendly atmosphere and they were hesitant, but that first year that they came and they saw how many of our, our community came out to support them, it blew them away. And now we're in our fifth year doing events with them. So it, um, you know, it, it really, after that point, we really didn't start looking for people as much as people contacting us. And then us just kind of going through, is this something that, you know, that we want to support that we can support and um, just kind of took off from there. And what kind of ask do you have for your partner? Cause obviously, you know, I'm going to make an assumption for you, Beth, and we'll hear from you in a moment, but I imagine when you Check work with the band, everybody. you want to have the band promote the concert too, just to do their part to spread the word. So Tammy, when you work with community partners, you know, do you ask them to do anything? I mean, we do. We them? we tell them we will match their their efforts in in promoting it. So we we will match your efforts. So if we see you out promoting on social media, we're gonna we're gonna equal that. Um, we have we have had a um, a a time or two that the um, people had events and they they really didn't do their part, and then they were just like you know well we thought this was going to be larger. And it was like, well, you know, we've not seen you post anything on your social media. So your people don't know where to come if you don't post that. So we started kind of making that we, we meet with whoever, whatever organization that we're going to be um, working with. We meet with them the month prior to the event and we sit down and we kind of go through everything um, from what, you know, so that they can, They'll know the layout of the of the brewery, the layout of the beer garden. And then that way they can let us know what they're trying to promote and if they're going to have giveaways, if they're going to be doing drawings. And we can promote that with our social media. So it, it has to be a partnership. Absolutely has to be a partnership. No, really good insight there. Beth, how about you? You know, what do you look for in a good partner, whether a band or a community organization? Yeah, anybody. 
that's working in our audio right now. But Wes, I mean, you work with breweries and wineries all across the country. And, you know, we want to assume everybody's a good fit, but maybe they're not. So what are you looking for when you interact with different companies? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. The The general thing we're looking for is somebody that's excited to welcome our members to their location that are good um, representatives of their own business and, and want to provide a really good experience. And so, you know, Beth and Tammy are great examples, right? Like people come, our viewers come to their uh, their breweries and they're, uh, they're met in the parking lot. They're shown where to park. They're invited in for a beer. It's just a very warm and welcoming experience. And I found like, no matter what the type of location, like that initial greeting and just saying, hello, like, please park here and come on in something that basic is a great way to set the tone of like, this is who we are. This is the hospitality we provide. Um, I literally saw a review on Solaria's page saying, somebody came out in the torrential rain to show me where to park. And like, it made all the difference. Uh, and so those little things, I mean, rainstorm, maybe not a little thing, but uh, those things of, of saying hello and welcoming somebody to your property, they just leave such a lasting impression. And um, I've seen it across all different industries that we work in. And so, you know, we found that to be great partners, people that are excited to welcome travelers in to, to hear their stories end up being great partners. Um, you know, we're, we're a business, but we also have a bit of a community feel to it. And um, folks that buy into that are really good for some partners that are just looking for a quick buck. Uh, maybe not as great of a fit. I, I tend to think if you provide a great experience, the money will follow. And we've seen that with our, our hosts across different categories. Uh, and, and to the point, you know, the, the title of the webinar here, like you'll get the repeat business too. Um, our RVers are, they're like geese, right? Like they migrate South in the winter and they head North in the summer. <laughs> and, um, a lot of them take the same route every year. A lot of them, you know, maybe add a couple more stops each time they do it. But I, I found a lot of them are, are staying in the same places if they're on the same route and they develop these friendships and these connections that, uh, you know, part of their annual journey is stopping by different breweries or farms or whatever it might be. And it, it's fun to see that, um, I love, see, I love seeing the harvest host come in with our attire on. It's like, you know, they're like, we've been here before. And I'm like, I can tell. <laughs> you know? so. yeah. Well, that's so cool, Tammy, because if someone comes back and they're so bragging about wearing your shirt that they got last summer, they're probably bragging about it to their friends back home saying, I went to this awesome brewery in Alabama last year and, you know, I'm wearing their shirt right now. Absolutely. Um, and that's that that has happened that has happened and we love that um that just you know it warms up it warms our hearts it makes us you know feel like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and i think for us we're all envious these people are out here traveling the world you know they're traveling the united states doing you know doing it on their own time and in having a great time so we love hearing their stories and you know they come in and they like to hear our story and we're you know for us it's like well you know we kind of feel like we're on a repeat with the same story but um, our staff, you know, our staff loves telling our story and we have great staff. They, they, you know, we just, they love sharing our story. They love hearing the harvest host, the harvest um, guest stories. And, you know, a lot of times when I come in the next day, they're like, oh, we had the coolest host last, you know, the harvest guest last night. They were telling us, you know, and they'll, they'll share the story that they had with them. So um, it just, it makes a nice community. It's just building a community, I feel like. So you and Wes just touched on a few of my favorite things. You've mentioned storytelling, you've mentioned connections, you talked about building engagement, engaging, just getting to know your guest. And one thing, Tammy, that you mentioned was not only sharing your story to the guests who come in, but also learning about the guests themselves. And I think it's so important, like when you share something about yourself, they're more likely to, you know, open up to you as well. And we see in the data speaks to it, you know, when you're able to build a connection with the guest, they're going to spend more money. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to come back sooner. They're going to really brag about that experience. And Wes, you touched on a simple hello. You know, that's something everybody looks for. No one likes to walk into a brewery and kind of feel like they're lost and not acknowledged. You know, that initial hello and that final goodbye, we really appreciated you. They go a long way. So I'd love to hear from everyone, you know, what are some of those little things that you have your staff do that you believe really stand out? You know, are there any training procedures you really enforce with them or anything points of interest you want them to share with your guest? You know, how do you get your team motivated to just share that story and want to get to know the guest? Wow, I don't even I, I think for us, 
it's just setting the example. You know, our our new you know new employees just kind of following what they see before them. And um, I, I we genuinely love to hear you know the the guest stories. And I think that's you know just making like you said everybody wants to feel welcome. And when we started this brewery, that was kind of the thing that my husband and I sat and talked about. I said, I want, when someone walks in the door, the first thing they do is exhale. I said, you know, you've been in a busy, busy day, run, 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 run. I said, and when they walk in here, I want them to go and they feel like they're at home, you know, they're amongst friends. And um, so it, that's what we try to create. And I, I feel that we've been successful with that. And that has kind of, played over into with even with our customers because our customers will sit and share our stories with the harvest um, when they come in. And so the harvest guests get to hear from it from not just our staff or from us, but also from just our regulars. And our regulars have gotten where they they love sitting at the corner of the bar waiting for the harvest host to come in. It's like, okay, I'm going to find something out about them, you know. <laughs> so you know, it's just it to me, it has been a it has been a great addition to our brewery. It really has. Awesome. Well, what about you about, you know, what are some of the little things that you believe at Cape Cod Beer make a big difference that your staff are doing? I think one of the things that's uh, a little bit odd about breweries, right? Unless you're really a brew pub, every brewery you walk in, you're like, okay, got to figure out where do I Right. That everybody walks through the door and they're they're just trying to figure out where they need to go. Um, and so the, the fascinating thing is that really you just have to talk to them. Hey, how are you? How's it going? And so just that whole like that first hello, um, because some people know exactly what they want. They only want to try your IPAs or they only want to try your light beers, whatever you know their goal is for that. But other people are like, I didn't know there was a brewery here. I have no idea how this works. We get my get my own beers is somebody going to wait on me and I, you know i like to joke that there's 10,000 breweries in the and there's 10,000 businesses None of them are the same. i haven't found exactly the same so ultimately for us it's just about meeting our customer where they're at you know because some people want to be waited on other people want to browse and not have anybody talk to them. um and so the other piece is that we end up with for that aren't necessarily or weren't necessarily right my brother wanted to come here i did so how do i you know how do we keep them happy make them happy provide them with something that isn't you know because they're like i don't like ipas and i'm sure you don't have anything for me. and it's like well but i bet we do you know and so just trying to understand that not everybody that walks through the door understands craft beer understands what an IBU is, understands the difference, between a, you know, Pilsner and a, you know, a Blanc, whatever. And so we just try to kind of make sure we're available to them, but aren't necessarily trying to curate everybody's experience exactly the same. Uh, we can be really busy in the summer. And so sometimes, especially if it's raining out, um, it's just about making sure everybody has a beer in their hand. Um, and uh you know and so basically our whole big thing is just be nice everybody has to be nice. <laughs> so beth you know you talk about kind of just looking at the guests and trying to craft the perfect experience for them how do you train your staff to read the room and just kind of know what experience that person requires or are you hiring based on certain practices to make sure you're finding people who kind of already know how to do that yes all of <laughs> one of the challenges that we have is that we have a here a housing um, Beth, your audio is a little in and out right now. I just want to make sure everybody can hear your insight. If I move a little bit closer, my uh, my ear pods died, so I think that's why I lost you guys. Um, part of the experience, part of the thing for us is that we struggle to find housing for our employees. Um, and the times of summer house, you know, people, kids come to, on Cape Cod to work. Colleges go back earlier and early every year. So really, while it would be nice to find perfectly trained and everybody that understands craft beer, we mostly understand that we also have to manage the play from where we get them. Um, and so there's a lot of training about beer. There's certainly training about visual. If all your customers sit around with their hands, you know, folded over their chest, it's probably because the tap is too cold, right? 
if all the women over 50 are fanning themselves, it's because the tap rooms form. These are not, you know, but but to a 25 year old, that might not be something they know. And so really it's about trying to sort of explain the experiences that we've learned over the years, you know, trying to cultivate that experience and turn it into training. Um, and sometimes it's, I think Tammy said before, it's mostly by example, right? Um, and so, I mean, we have some set training, we use some existing training, you know, like the Cicerone server training, stuff like that. Um, but then there's also stuff, you know, we want all of our employees to be able to give a tour. So, but not everybody has the wherewithal, right? The confidence to give a group of people a tour. And so we try to make sure that we can hire people. We ask some very specific questions uh, in our, you know, first interview collection, you know, like, you need a microphone or would you prefer to use a microphone? That, you know, that tells a lot about somebody. Uh, and so we just, we just kind of, it's a lot of it's evolved over time um, and just kind of understand both the needs of our staff, the needs of our customer base. Um, and just, we get a lot of feedback. We have a mug club. And so these are sort of our, our, you know, really super committed regulars that come in. Um, and they're more than willing to tell us when we screw something up or when there's things that they think we can do better. Um, and they're certainly happy to celebrate our success. So that's one thing I wanted to ask you about prior, because, you know, I think there's so much value in offering brewery tours, Beth, but so many breweries aren't doing them anymore for whatever reason. Why is that an important aspect of your taproom experience? We used to do a tour, a tour every and I led most of those. Um, but it got to the point where we were so busy, we couldn't actually bring people into the brewery every day. And so it ended up basically, some people would say it ended up being basically a sales pitch. Other people loved it because it told our story. Um, and then what we realized is over time, nobody's in production walk people everywhere and they can touch just about every uh, do it and so for us for many 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 years when craft beer wasn't as you know prolific as it is now some of our great you know, people that came to the tour and enjoyed the beer and understood our story understood where driving around with our two kids. And Beth, your audio is a little in and out again. I apologize. I wanted to let you know. Sorry. I don't know how to make it better. Um, I don't, you know, people were excited about this, hearing the stories about how we started because 20 years later, we're completely different. Um, and so we just, we've gone back to doing tours because we put them up there. And if 12, if, you know, I think we do three people show up, we do the tour. If less than three people do, we refund everybody their money. We charge them like, I want to say it's like six or seven dollars and basically you get a beer at the end of the tour. So it's pretty much free. Um, and uh, and people have, the people that want to go, go. But the people that don't want to be there, you know, aren't, gonna, aren't willing to sign up. So it's worked out really well for us. And do you see that those who go on tours, I mean, this is anecdotally speaking, like have a deeper connection to your brewery. Do you maybe see them come back sooner? What are the positives that emerge? The weird part about us is that most of the people that we see may never come back here, you know, because they're a tourist on Cape Cod and they live in Iowa and are going to come to the East Coast, you know, once every five years, whatever. And so, or they're going to go to Cape Cod this year and they might go to Maine next year or whatever. And so, um, but I think it's the people that don't necessarily live on Cape Cod that but live close enough to come and enjoy a tour, spend the day on the Cape or two days on the Cape. Um, those people we do see. In fact, I was literally running out of the brewery to leave and the guy stopped, was like, hey, you're one of the owners, right? Like we met at a wedding and I, you know, he lives like an hour away. It, it's a Wednesday in March and he's drinking in the tap room. And so at some point, it's hard to know where those people come from and how you met them and what made them come back. And so for us, we're just like, let's try to make every experience we have as good as we can, because that's what people want. They want to say, I had a really good time there. I met the owners or I got to meet the owner's dog or, you know, I was sitting at a, in a 
at a beer t a beer garden table and my dog was panting and somebody walked up and offered me a bowl of water for my dog or you know like little things it's they're not difficult things but those are the things that people seem to remember um about their experience yeah the little things truly make a big difference and wes you talk a lot about the harvest host reviews that you see from your host like what are some of the more positive things that you see then you know what i'd also love to hear the negative ones that you know are hurting someone's experience I think uh, clarity and communication, uh, whether that's pre-arrival or during arrival, um, is huge for us. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of our members are driving, you know, 10,000 pound pieces of machinery. Like it's a nerve wracking experience. It's, it's daunting going somewhere new. And so the more you can communicate like, hey, this is how you get here. This is where you park. Look at this sign. Come in and tell us you're here and we can show you exactly how to back in. Like those little cues of like, Hey, I want you to arrive and arrive with less anxiety. Um, it's huge. Like that makes a huge difference. And, um, uh, travel is interesting, right? Like travel is a lot of fun and it's exciting and you get that dopamine rush from doing something new, but it's also a little scary and anxiety inducing. And so the more we can do to, to elevate the good experience part, like the excitement and the adventure piece and minimize the anxiety piece, the better the experience for all parties. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of that with reviews, like super communicative about the arrival, greeted me outside, invited me in, and then just talked with me, like told me the story of Cape Cod beer, told me the story of, you know, and we have so many diverse experiences. I think that's what people like is collecting the stories. You know, I stayed at a, People are saying, you know, I stayed at a alpaca farm and then I went to a brewery and then I went to a missile silo. Like we've just got all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's it's a lot of fun to collect stories. And I think that's what people are looking for, whether they're travelers or not. Um, and so, you know, I love hearing these stories, like talking about how, how you can pick up on those little cues and make the experience so much better. The little things really matter uh, is what I've learned in reading those reviews. And I really don't like to get negative, but I am curious, you know, are there ever times where an experience doesn't go the way you might want it to for your host, for the guest? You know, if so, what are those factors that are contributing to these, you know, not ideal experiences? Yeah, I think sometimes um, if there's too much pushiness around like a transaction, it can come across as negative or demanding. And a lot of our members, they're, they're more than happy to spend money. We have a suggested $30 minimum. I've heard stories of people coming in and dropping, you know, one of our hosts is a winery in Michigan, got an email saying somebody walked in and bought a thousand dollars worth of wine not too long ago. Like those are insane stories, right? They're great stories. Um, but most of our members, like you, you read through the Facebook page, they're like, yeah, it's a $30 suggestion. You know, I'm spending a hundred bucks a pop cause I love it. And they're, they're more than willing to support a local business. Um, beers are particularly easy sell, I think. Um, but I think just letting consumers and our travelers get there on their own, you provide a good experience, the money will follow. And maybe, you know, maybe some cheap folks. Some cheap that was folks. a fun sound effect. Here, Sorry. Think, <laughs> but on, on average, it'll it'll exceed kind of the minimum as long as a good experience is provided. So that's one big thing that jumps out is the, um, you know, people feeling like they're cornered to spend money. Uh, or, or just not getting the communication. That's the other piece that comes through a lot. Beth, you have anything to add to that? Um, yes. Um, so we, we're we super busy in the summer, like super busy. And we have four spots for Harvest Hosts. And back when Harvest we first started doing Harvest Hosts, all the communication went through me individually. And we finally got to the point where I couldn't manage it. I couldn't manage people that were showing up at 11 o'clock at night or whatever. And so... We finally put together a PDF, and everybody who requests uh, a spot and gets approved gets this PDF, and it's very specific. And I've had more people text me lately, thank you so much for the map and where I'm supposed to be and where I'm not supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do. And, and it's funny because ultimately people just, they want to be guided. They want to be told. Um, we've had some negative reviews where like one person's like, it, we have a refrigeration unit in the summer that uh, that chills two large tractor trailers full of beer because so, we don't have wow. a unit. And, uh, you know, one person will complain about it. The other person will say it was the quietest stop on their trip. It, it, it's 
it kind of works like any review, right? The the unit neck the person camped next to them might have something that's loud on their camper and they'll complain about that and put put it on my review and you know, so at some point you kind of have to squint and look at the whole thing. Like are people generally having a good time? You know, people will complain about the road noise of the road. I mean, we're a industrial plant. Same like, that. <laughs> Like we are not a state park, right? And you know, the other piece is that we're the only harvest host on Cape Cod and there's not a lot near us. And so we close during the winter during a couple of days of the week, but we've decided not to close harvest host. So we leave it open, but we're very specific, like check our website, make sure you know what our hours are, you know, because I can't I can't keep the harvest host stuff up to date as quickly as I want them to. And so people would be like, oh, I was really bummed out they were closed, you know, like one star. I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but but the, the positives definitely outweigh the negatives. And at some point, we have people that know we have this one event every year on such and such a date. They wait, they know exactly when the Harvest Host calendar is gonna open. They book the thing so that they can sleep in the parking lot and go to this band that they love. You know, and, and so you know you're resonating that those are your people, right? And those are the people you want to be able to come back. And then you, uh, on the other hand, you'll have Harvest Host where they're like, I had no idea that this was going on. Like, oh, this is our biggest event of the year. You just happened to be here sleeping in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm curious. And Beth, I'd love to ask you a quick follow-up. And Tammy, love how you're, you do with this situation. Like, what do you do when a situation starts to go a little sour, not in an ideal direction? Like, how do you make it not just an okay experience, but take that bad experience and make it something amazing? That way they're now your biggest fan. You know, it, I think it depends on what the situation is. And and part of the thing is, half the time you don't know these things are going badly until three days later you read the bad review, right? You know, and, and that's, that's difficult. Um, we haven't had too many... Our, our staff is really adaptable and really good at sort of reading when things are going south. You know, and a lot of times it's just like, hey, the owner's here. Maybe I could get them to give you a tour. Would you like that? And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, now we're now I'm you know, like, can you please spend 15 minutes with this customer who's not happy because we ran out of the beer they drove from Rhode Island to buy? You know, and frequently there's things that we can do that people enjoy that necessarily mean give them free stuff all the time. Our staff's pretty good at understanding that, like, we can always go for the free stuff but maybe there's an experience that we can do just by listening to what it is that, cause they really wanted this beer. I, I was at a lecture the other day at a conference the other day, and the woman was talking about how this guy had driven from three States away to get a beer that they were out of. And she's like, if I gave him a clipping, she said, I gave him a different beer and I gave him a clipping of one of our pothos plants that he could put in the beer after he drank it. So he would always remember our brewery. And I was like, okay, that was brilliant. Um, and she's like, the guy was so excited, more excited about the piece of the plant that she had given him as a clipping than he was about the beer, right? Because somebody had just thought off the top of their head, you know, sort of use what you got, not what you don't got, and uh, and made somebody happy. No, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Tammy, you know, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on what we're diving into now. When you were talking about negatives, I really, we haven't experienced any we haven't, um, the only negative thing that anyone has said has been the, the, the train noise, but it clearly states on our site when they go to, to, um, to sign in to our book a date with us that we are located between two train tracks, <laughs> you know, so there, there will be train noise. Um, but that's been the only negative thing that we have seen that's come across with the, on our harvest host, um, site. So, and, you know, as far as that, there's not a lot I can do about that. That's that's just that's, that's our location. But um, I think, you know, again, you know, whenever if, if we were to have something like that, I probably would reach out to that person and see how I could address, you know, whatever it was that maybe, you know, that they weren't happy with. Um, I know here in Alabama, we've had a lot of um, flash floods. And so that has been, you know, our parking area will 
just be, that's what I told him. I said, I don't charge extra for the lakefront property because it becomes lakefront property really quick. And, um, but, you know, with that, we offer them an umbrella, you know, I'll, we'll take out an umbrella to the camper and it's like, hey, when you get ready to come in and just, you can leave it out here, we'll grab it the next day or we'll have somebody, you know, to walk you back to your camper at night, those kind of things. Um, but, you know, as far as, just trying to accommodate, you know, just trying to do to them what we would like, you know, basically treat them the way I would want to be treated. No, you all have offered such great insight today. You know, I want to dive into one more thing. We've talked about building a lot of loyalty. We haven't really used the term loyalty, but by building connections with, you know, your guests, your travelers coming through and that that's going to make them want to come back. What other strategies do you all see that you can, you know, build loyalty? I know, Beth, you mentioned the mug club program. Tammy, maybe some sort of loyalty program that you all have or some sort of incentives. You know, how are you doing this and things like that to build a dedicated customer base? We really, as far as a loyalty customer wise, like, a, you know, a mug group or anything, we've not um, we have not implemented that just because we really are outgrowing our, our, our space that we're in right now. We just don't have the, um, the space to, to house that kind of thing. But um, I think for us, it is just staying connected, just, you know, staying connected to, um, to our guests. And I, for us, I mean, we do have our regulars and again, we are so small and it, we're just community driven that if we haven't seen say, you know, Mr. Scott hasn't been in, in the last couple of weeks, you know, myself or one of the staff members might reach out to them on social media and just, Hey, just wanted to check on you. And we've found that a couple of times that some of them have been in the hospital. We send, you know, a, just a get well card and stuff. So just those little things, letting them know that you're being missed. Um, and it, it really is just caring. I guess that that's the, the main thing is just caring really about the customers. Beth, how about you? You know, talk to the loyalty and, you know, how are you maintaining that loyalty and just getting these guests to turn from those one time visitors to hopefully coming back next time they're in Cape Cod? One of the big things that we've been trying to um, push recently is that we want them to know our employees, right? That we want them to know our staff, the brew crew, because it's not just about them knowing who we are, it's about them having access to talk to the staff more about, you know, Everybody thinks it's cool. Like you're a brewer. That's totally cool. Like, tell me what that's like. Um, and so ultimately we try to, we try to give them the things that they want. You know, they want certain events to happen. Um, they, you know, the mug club for us turned into something because we had such a strong regular base. Um, and then we had people that wanted to start serving tables. And so we were like, okay, how do we do this in a way that, do it fairly. So we're like, okay, we started to come up with different things that people want. We couldn't just be like, anybody can reserve a table because that was, we knew that wasn't going to work. So we decided that we would put together sort of this package of things that ended up turning into our mug club. And uh, and it allows them to reserve tables, you know, um, and they have, we have a special party just for the mug clubbers every year. And that, the mug club's grown every year. Um, they get discounts beer or they get sorry they get a 20 ounce beer for the price of 16 beer every time they come in um and so and there were things that we used to do that we don't do anymore because they used to get like advanced purchase on beers and the production team was like okay that we can't re we can't release the beer a day early for the mug club it's like it, it wasn't working well and not enough people were not enough people cared it's like okay we're going to take that off the mug club list um and so and the funny part is that the mug clubbers convince other mug clubbers to join the mug club. Uh, and so, <laughs> so just like Tammy was saying how the Harvest Host people, you know, how the regulars talk to the Harvest Host people and tell our story because they know our story. Um, oh, I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of a big thing. The other piece is, like I said, we do a lot of charity events. And so it's really about making sure that the charities that our regular customers want us to support or in our employees to uh, are being supported, that it's not just sort of pet projects that my husband and I are interested in and that it really represents the entire company and the culture of our company and the, and the things that our employees care about as much as the things that Todd and I care about. One of the things that we do um, is that when we do charity events, we allow 
each of the staff members to pick a charity of their choice for us, you know, when we plan an event. So each one of them gets a, a special charity that's dear to their hearts that we will support. And so that um, that has really made also kind of invest the employees into the event as well. It makes them invested and in which in turn helps, you know, us promote it within the, the company itself. And then their friends are going to know, hey, this is something that's supporting Rachel, or this is something that, you know, that Karen really is, you know, passionate about, you know. So I think allowing staff to be part of that, you know, being part of, of choosing these things. Same thing with, like I said, with it, hosting the events and, you know, the karaoke and things of that, just letting staff be part of it. Tammy, that, that's great. I mean, it starts at the top. It's you and your husband's vision when you started the company. And when you can get your staff to be super passionate brand advocates for you, they start telling the story to the guests and the guests start telling the story to other guests who are just coming through for a <laughs> night in town. And that, that's beautiful. So you all have shared so many great ideas and, you know, examples of what you're doing right. You know, everybody listening today is also trying to create memorable experiences. I'd love to go around the circle one more time. And if you had to give one piece of actionable advice to people listening, what's the one thing you believe that they should do right now to just maximize experiences and connections at their brewery and take it any direction you want. And Wes, you did start us first. So I'm going to let you finish us off again, but you know, what's the advice that you give? Yeah, I think, uh, be creative. I, I think people are just looking for something unique. Um, I'll also shamelessly say it, check out Harvest Host. Uh, I was going to get there. Don't worry. Like, um, <laughs> And it's funny, you're talking about loyalty to customers. We also think of our hosts as, as our customers and key constituents. And so we're always trying to breed loyalty and provide a great experience to folks like Beth and Tammy. And so we're constantly launching new features and sending newsletters and we try to get out and visit folks. And um, But I mean, I, I think the unique experiences are just so fun. Like people are looking for those these days. It's, it's such a right moment to be part of the experiential economy. Oh, yeah, 100%. It's all about those experiences. Tammy, what's your takeaway that everybody should hear? Wow, that you know, it's hard to just wrap it all up in one little thing. I know. <laughs> what's on your mind right now? <laughs> well, I think for us, you know, again, we just we're individuals, and that's what you know, we just kind of stay connected to our customers, like you said, staying connected on what's today's events that are going on ways that we can connect with with people that are traveling from different parts of the country. You know, um, we are, you know, in the South, naturally, you can you can tell from my, <laughs> my dialect. So um, but just, you know, good old Southern hospitality is what we promote here. And that's, you know, that seems to be working for us. So awesome. Well, thanks for being here today. Beth, take us home. I think it's important to look either look back on events that you've done that have been very successful. Um, figure out why they've been very successful and then try to figure out how you can not do the same thing, but find either reach out to those people again or find they would really appreciate and move forward with, you know, that kind of thing. Because in many cases we forget what we've done that have been successful because time has passed. And so ultimately the other pieces, I think our customers know they want what do you want us to do next? Where should we go next? Somebody's knocking at my door, so I have to go. <laughs> awesome, Beth. It's a pleasure having you here today, Tammy, as well. And Thank Wes, you. for anyone interested in learning more about Harvest Host, how can they do so? Yeah, go to harvesthost.com. Uh, I think you posted in the comments there. Uh, there's a Become a Host page on the website. Check it out. Um, you can sign up. If you have questions, just put your name in the form. We'll have somebody reach out to you answer all your questions, talk to you like a real person. Um, and it's totally free for small businesses and breweries to join. So that's the other thing, like it doesn't cost a thing. We don't take a penny of your sales. We love supporting small business. It's in our DNA and would love to have more breweries on the network. It's, it's such a fun partnership. No, absolutely. Wes, always enjoy talking with you and Tammy and Beth. I hope to share pints with you soon. Everybody else have a great day. See you soon. Bye. Bye.